One hundred years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, Fifty years since Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, America has not only become a more diverse nation, but a nation that embraces its diversity. American cities have become cultural and ethnic melting pots, and no place exemplifies that more than Jersey City. But as many have noted, Jersey City's diversity is a tale of two cities, across economic and racial lines, which divides the newer and wealthier population from the poorer and native population. Unfortunately, that divide continues to grow and can be seen not only through the growth of luxury high-rises, but through the lack of local business opportunities and employment on residential and commercial developments in the city. Longtime activist Yvonne Balser speaks about the frustration many residents have had with the lack of employment on these developments, especially those where the taxpayers invested, which are governed by project labor agreements. Jersey City has a very high employment rate and our people are not being hired, especially minorities and female workers. Taxpayers made an investment to make sure with these labor agreements that our people are hired, and they're not being hired at all. During the May 2013 Jersey City Municipal election, both Council President Lavaro and Mayor Fulop echoed Ms. Balser's sentiment. Just recently I requested a report on the very main part with regard to what sort of jobs and opportunity jobs were given to Jersey City residents. Of the 19 jobs on the cleanup of, the, of, the, of that park, only one job is back to a Jersey City resident and not a minority. So we need to do a better job. Let me talk about the real job situation in Jersey City. And I think of two people that I know. The first one is Naeem, a resident of Ward F, who had one infraction a couple of years ago. He's a graduate of college, looks at all the progress in Jersey City and says, I can't get a job. Or I think about Danya Caballero, who's a regular uh, resident of the Lafayette section, and she says that she's had a plumbing contracting business, third generation, third generation, and actually says that, look, I don't see why I can't get work on, on any of these sites with all the progress here. Those are the real issues. In the year 2007, then Councilman Fulop voted in favor of the city's project labor agreement, which established the terms and conditions of employment on city construction projects. Jersey City's PLA specifically requires union labor, but only requires that unions and developers act in good faith to hire locals, minorities, and women. African American Chamber of Commerce President John Harmon claims these PLAs haven't had a positive effect on employment for minorities or women. From my personal experience and the research that I've seen, PLAs have had no favorable impact on employment and contracts for minorities and women in construction. Even though project labor agreements haven't achieved the desired outcomes that they were promised to the public, many politicians have continued to advocate for them. Mr. Harmon theorizes why. In most urban cities in New Jersey, the elected Democratic officials' campaigns are overwhelmingly funded by unions who promote project labor agreements under the pretense that they will create jobs and contracts for minority and women. But in reality, the real winners are the elected official and the unions. No jobs, no contracts for minorities and women. That's especially true in Jersey City where Mayor Fulop ran with the support of many unions, especially those that receive work through the city's PLA. Mr. Balser explains how those PLAs are used to sell tax breaks for developers to Jersey City residents. During an abatement hearing, you have union leaders, workers, and Jersey City residents coming for the city council and asking to please pass the abatements. But six months down the road, you will find maybe a union worker or Jersey City resident will come for the city council and say they cannot find work, they're not being hired, so it's not working to protect them. No person illustrates that more than Jersey City resident Stephen Mays. I became a member of IBEW Local 164 in the year 2000, working with a small company called Wilmom Technologies. After a year and a half, Wilmom Technologies folded. 
I was required to go back to the local union working from the bench. The local union sent me out on various jobs throughout the state. While on these jobs, I started questioning myself, why aren't I working closer to home? Why aren't I even working in Jersey City? From there, I started learning and finding them more information out, and then I heard about the project labor agreement. That's where his problems with the union started. After reading and researching the project labor agreement, I started attending city council meetings, wondering why Jersey City residents such as myself and others weren't getting the jobs on the sites governed by the project labor agreement. After a number of council meetings, I believe the union hall caught wind of what I was doing. After that, the harassment started. When the union start found out that I was attending council meetings and complaining about the project labor agreement, I started having other problems. One of my first problems, they required me to attend training all over again. As a level eight apprentice, they started me in training as a level one apprentice. I began to be harassed by the training director of the local union. I was also being harassed by other management members at local union 164. Shortly after that, I found myself kicked out of the local union with no work and no job. He also added his thoughts about the local minority workforce on PLA construction sites. From what I've seen in Jersey City construction sites, the only jobs being made available to locals and minorities are the laborers' jobs. The higher paying and higher skilled jobs are just not available. Both Council President Lavaro and Mayor Fulop made promises about guaranteeing Jersey City residents employment and business opportunities with the PLAs. In the past five years, um, the budget was cut in such a way that it eliminated the oversight and monitoring for those top project labor grants. Team Fulop, our team will restore those budget, uh, those budget cuts and make sure that we have vigorous and rigorous uh, enforcement and compliance for project labor agreements. We're talking about holding companies accountable that have made commitments. You can't just come in here and get a tax abatement for 20 years and don't think somebody's going to hold you accountable for that commitment. Ms. Balser explains why Mayor Phillips' promise was more about gaining votes than being sincere with city residents. The city could take the developer to court, the city could revoke the abatement, but basically speaking, this is a handshake between the city and the developer. It has no power at all. Mr. Harmon thinks that issue could be solved. I do believe that project labor agreements can be improved, but we must move beyond good faith requirements and put some teeth in these agreements that will assure that locals, minorities, and women will have good representation on these construction projects. But he also adds what he thinks the real solution to the issues minorities and women face on New Jersey construction sites. Greater access to capital for minority and women-owned businesses. Effective training programs for local residents to prepare them for the jobs in their community. And lastly, and most importantly, holding elected officials accountable to their campaign promises. Finally. With the new Fulop administration set in place, Ms. Balser states what Jersey City taxpayers and residents want to see. We want to see our people hired. We want to see the local people here in which taxpayers have made an investment hired with these project labor agreements. The, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition 